After more than a year of investigation, the FBI recently issued its final report on the October 2017 Las Vegas mass shooting. It's a three-page summary document. It says gunman Stephen Paddock had no ideological or political goals. It says he had no clear motive. The FBI described Paddock as having suicidal tendencies and a desire for infamy. The report did lead to some criticism because it was so short. Aaron Rouse, head of the FBI in Nevada, oversaw the investigation. Special Agent Rouse, welcome back. Thank you for having me. So, Special Agent Rouse, this report on the largest mass murder in modern American history came out almost 16 months after the shooting. It was a massive undertaking. What was the FBI trying to find? We were interested in answering the question that everybody had on their mind. Why did this happen? And as I said, very close to the event when we were starting this, uh, this endeavor to try and figure out why, is that we believe that absent some direct piece of evidence that said that the subject did this event for X reason, we were going to try and come as close as possible to answering that question why without asking the subject, which was now impossible, as we could possibly come. The report does that. And I understand that the length of the report was off-putting to many people. But understanding that this is a summary of the findings, the amount and volume of work that went into the creation of these findings was nothing short of Herculean. We had about 25 people that were focused on this particular question, why? And that included experts from outside of the FBI, people that were specialists in their fields of psychiatry and forensic psychology. I think that when you're going outside of your own organization to verify that the information that you have is accurate and follows with what the evidence shows, I think that's a great mark of professionalism on the part of the FBI. And I'm very proud of the Behavioral Analysis Unit for all of the efforts that they put forward. That being said, in these three pages, there's a lot of information that tells you about the subject. It tells you about his background. It tells you about his upbringing. It talks about the factors that the Behavioral Analysis Unit believe went into the decision process to commit this heinous event. And I believe that if you look at the Behavioral Analysis Compendium of all active shooters that they released in uh, the summer of last year, they took a look at the sh active shooting that had occurred in the U.S. from 2000 to 2013. And based on that, they were able to come up with some very significant findings regarding active shooters in general. If you compare that report and their findings in that compendium to the shooter, Stephen Paddock, you are going to see a lot of similarities, a lot of those tick marks that you can make off of, yes, this the subject was occupied this realm or had these beliefs or did these this uh, amount of planning. But one of the most impressive things to me, and I was not aware of this before I read the report, 21% of the time, 21% of the time, that's not insignificant, the active shooter does not want somebody to know why. They leave no artifact. They leave no memorandum. They leave no video. They don't tell anybody. And that was even highlighted more recently in the California shooting that took place at the restaurant. That shooter actually said on Facebook, people are going to wonder why I did this and I don't want them to know. So that's, this falls into a defined understanding of how active shooters behave. I think that they got it right in the fact that there were a lot of physical, mental, and financial stressors on the subject in this case, that there was a desire to have a degree of infamy and to leave this world on their own terms. And the amount of work and the amount of effort that went into this to check and recheck and re-verify the facts that we had garnered during the investigation was quite impressive. All this information, 25 people working on this, probably thousands of hours. Why just three pages? Why not release you know, a busload of stuff? Well, the, the desire was to get out the findings to the public so that they understood what we understood to be the facts, 
what we understood to be the motivating aspects and, and the environmental aspects of the shooter. And this was all designed to aid the Metropolitan Police in their investigation to ensure that they had everything that they needed to complete the investigation. Because I remind you, this was a local investigation that the FBI provided a great amount of assistance. Over a thousand personnel worldwide worked on this investigation for the Metropolitan Police Department. They came up with a lot of great information in a short amount of time to ensure that there was only one shooter involved in this, to verify that we had absolutely everything we, we could possibly check out to ensure that there was nobody else out there. And that was a, the item that was really at the forefront of everyone's mind in the early stages of this investigation. When we got into trying to figure out the why, I would say that it doesn't matter how long the findings are. These three pages are the findings. They are not the complete report. That report is releasable via FOIA. We're going to have a link, by the way, to that report at knpr.org. Special Agent Rouse, after it was released, a survivor of the attack expressed disappointment, telling a newspaper it's going to be tough to move on without knowing a motive. I wonder, one, if you feel the same way, and two, what would you say to her? Spending considerable time with the people that have been affected by this heinous event, it can't help but move you. There is not a person that lives in this town that was not affected in one way, shape, or form by this event. I wish that we had a direct answer to tell that person that this person, that this subject, did this event for a specific reason. I would say to them that this report shows the psychological makeup, the physical makeup, and the financial makeup that went into undoubtedly the decision to commit this act. We hope that it can bring some closure to people. That's always our desire. But I can say to her that the very best effort of the Federal Bureau of Investigation went into this, that we were interested in the same answer that she wanted. And we believe that we have provided as close an answer as we could possibly come in this report. I'm talking to Aaron Rouse. He's the special agent in charge of the Las Vegas field office for the FBI. His office recently issued a report on Stephen Paddock, the man who killed 58 and injured hundreds more in the October 1st shooting in 2017. Uh, Now, uh, Special Agent Rouse, the FBI obviously hopes to learn from these investigations. Uh, Maybe you find something in the shooter's background, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that might help prevent or catch criminals in the future. Did you get something like that from this? Well, uh, can you talk about the takeaway? What was learned that might help in future investigations? You know, Joe, thanks for asking that question, because in any event, any critical incident, we always learn something. There's always something you can take away from that to hopefully safeguard the public better in the future. Now, I take part in a a group every month. It's the corporate security group, and this is law enforcement and the large hotel and casino uh, concerns around the the Vegas area. And we talk about issues that affect the safety and security of the patrons that come here to recreate. They want to come here for their conventions. They want to come here for a good time. And the casinos and the the hotels and all the law enforcement stand together to want to make that a safe and a pleasant experience. So we talk about trends. We talk about things that we're seeing that bad guys are trying to do, whether it is the latest in money laundering or scams of patrons or things like that. But as a result of 1 October, we learned a lot of things that are now you're seeing changes in procedures amongst the casino concerns and the hotel uh, industry regarding how they deal with patrons how they deal with the uh, much-talked-about do-not-disturb moniker that's on rooms. What is intrusive? What is an appropriate level of engagement? And what to do with that information? Now, obviously, we cannot expect that the bellboy or the, the front desk clerk is going to instantaneously become a law enforcement officer trained to that degree. But there are signs and there are symptoms that you can look at to say, this doesn't seem right to me. And you have to have a good use, a 
good funnel for that information so that people can take another look at it and perhaps take some action. There's a number of procedures that I know that the casinos are, are undertaking, but those are secret for a very good reason. We don't want the bad guys to be informed by what's going on, but I have a much better degree of confidence that the casino industry, the hotels around here, they take this very seriously. They don't want anything bad to happen to any of their patrons, and they're working diligently to improve security procedures, and they're working with law enforcement to do it. Would you say these are major changes, and you you have this confidence? Do you think a Stephen Paddock could get away with this again, or are the things that are incorporated now, I mean, you can never say never, but good enough to prevent it from ever happening again? I think they're going in the right direction, Joe. I think that what you're seeing is that they saw how this was executed, the methodical nature, the, there was a lot of planning that went into this. There were a lot of procedures that were, I think, taken advantage of because of the status of that of the subject in uh in the casino industry as far as uh, their level of comps and what's normal. It's hard to say what's normal in Las Vegas because we are the home of the unusual request. <laughs> and so they want to be hospitable, but there has to be a balance between being hospitable and providing for the safety and security of their patrons. I will say that the changes that are being made will in the long run, significantly reduce the chances of this happening again. But you can never say never. And security requires vigilance, and not just on the law enforcement and security professionals or the the employees at these, these institutions. Being situationally aware is a responsibility everybody has when they're out in public because you'll see something that maybe not strike you as, as maybe it's odd. Maybe it gives you a bad feeling. We have instincts for a reason. And the one thing I would want your listeners to know is if you have a bad feeling about something, you have information, you have a feeling that somebody is up to no good, it's your responsibility to call that in, to be a part of this community, to ensure the protection of this community. The police are not going to make fun of you. The FBI is not going to make fun of you. We would rather take a thousand calls that go absolutely nowhere than to miss one that's going to help us save lives. A lot of people, as you mentioned, were affected by the shooting. How did the experience of investigating this affect your agents? There is a price to pay to be in this line of work, and there's a cumulative toll that it will take on people. We're not robots. The police aren't robots. We have many people here who have been in in actual combat. We've had people that have been involved in multiple critical incidents throughout their career. Every incident's a little different, and there's a cumulative effect that does take a toll on somebody. But what I'm proud about is that we have systems in place that can help those that might be struggling with what they're seeing or what they're feeling effectively and appropriately deal with those feelings, and they're able to still contribute. And they're not, and I asked this about Las Vegas Metro officers as well, but some 800 uh, Las Vegas personnel sought some form of counseling after the shooting. I had asked Metro Brass, are they looked down upon in the sort of macho world of law enforcement? Is that something that uh, if they want to advance further in their career, somebody would look askance at that uh, because they, they sought help? I, I wonder about in the FBI what it's like. You know, we do not judge somebody because they're human, and you cannot be a robot in this business. And anyone that says differently, they're lying to you. There is an appropriate use of the counseling services that we have that can keep you active, that can keep you in the game, and it can keep you being productive to safeguard Americans. And that's the mission, protect the American people, uphold the Constitution for the FBI. We're not going to judge somebody because they're human. We're going to try and help them to stay productive because we spend a lot of time, effort, and money training them to be an effective part of what I will tell you is the greatest law enforcement agency in the world. And that comes with a little pride, I'll say it. And I'll also say that there is that culture that says, well, I'm, I'm a tough person. I, I'm not going to admit that I might need some help. 
we've done a lot to break down that notion and show all of our personnel that it's safe for you to come forward and say, I need to talk to somebody about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And the results are very, very positive. And my goal is the same goal as any executive of any law enforcement agency. I don't want to add to the casualty count of that heinous event. We're going to be talking about things that the FBI is moving on into. But before we do, I want to ask you a personal question. Do you still think about the shooting? And and I wonder if it's affected you at all. Like I said, you can't go through something like that and not be affected. I do on occasion think about it, but it's in the venue of what we learned from this. And are we doing enough to try and make sure that it doesn't happen again? I'm not going to allow Stephen Paddock to rule my life. I'm not going to allow this event to rule my life or define me. I'm going to overcome this just like I think the victims are going to overcome this and the people that were affected by this are going to overcome this. There's lessons to be learned here and my focus is on learning those lessons, educating the public on those lessons, educating the industries that I can on those lessons and make sure that we do everything we can, everything in our power to make sure it doesn't happen again. As head of the FBI's Las Vegas field office, Aaron Rouse oversaw the massive investigation that tried to determine a motive and a profile of shooter Stephen Paddock. That investigation is over. The FBI's report is on our website, knpr.org. The FBI office here now is putting out some warnings about cybercrime, including a relatively new form of crime that holds someone's computer for ransom. Uh, Special Agent Rouse, uh, business email compromise is part of this whole new cybercrime, I won't call it an initiative, but it's this weird wave that's going on. Can you talk about that? Sure. A business email compromise is when you receive an email from somebody you think is part of your organization, and many times it'll have an attachment. And we get emails, we get flooded with emails every day. And if it's somebody that you know, most importantly, if it's somebody that is your supervisor or perhaps the head of your company, and there's an attachment with what clear indicates uh, some sort of action needs to be taken, you're going to click on that attachment. And when you do, a lot of bad things can happen because if it's been engineered by a hacker or even some of the uh, organized groups that are out there, what that attachment then does is it executes code. And it can shut down your systems. It can allow for somebody else to look at all of the information in your systems. And it could also be a conduit for someone to have you execute a fraudulent wire transfer to a third party. Well, without you being part of it, like acknowledging or reading that you're transferring this or... Well, in many cases, when somebody's receiving something that says, we want you to execute a wire transfer, that's a very specific and designated target for the business email compromise. And that's a person that has the ability to move money. And if they receive a request from whom they think to be chief financial officer, it could be their supervisor, hey, you need to send this money to this account right away for whatever reason, some people, unfortunately too many people, don't question that. And so they end up sending that wire transfer, and that's at a loss for the company. And sometimes we're talking millions of dollars. There's another thing called ransomware. I've heard about this for a few years now, but it's pretty new to some people. This is sort of a computer virus that threatens the computer owner. But more specifically, what kind of threats? And how does this work? So ransomware is when you click on a link or you click on a uh, attachment and very soon after that your screen ends up altering and you are advised that all of your data has been locked and that to access that data you have to follow some very specific instructions to get the the person who instigated that lock to release it this can result in a loss of data this can result in obviously a loss of money their favorite habit is to use cryptocurrency because they believe it's it's un- untraceable. Uh, but the bottom line is that many, too many people are paying that ransom to get their computers unlocked. 
they feel like it might be cost of doing business, we would argue that that's probably not a good idea for you to do because there's no guarantee that they're not going to come back to you 30 days, 60 days, 90 days later and do it all over again. Because once you've been compromised, once your system has been compromised like that, it can very easily be locked again. So our recommendation is that you not pay the ransom, that you notify us through uh, ic3.gov, which is our Internet Crimes uh, Complaint Area, and report what's going on, work with the local field office, in this case the Las Vegas field office, to try and figure out who's doing this to you. The sooner we get involved, the better the chances are that we can catch them. And the most important thing I can tell anybody is that if you have data, you should have your information, your critical information, if you're, if you're a business, whatever, you want to make sure that you have backups on a completely unconnected system because it will help you get back up and running much faster than you would if, if that's your only system. You know, when telemarketing fraud was a bigger issue, it's still an issue, uh, authorities would regularly shut down boiler rooms here in Las Vegas. Uh, ransomware is a cybercrime, but I wonder if Las Vegas especially attracts cyber criminals the way it attracted criminal telemarketers. We don't have the corner on the market. This is something that is a nationwide event. All field offices, all of our 56 field offices are dealing with this uh, situation. But there's good news out of this, Joe. All right. The, the sad news is that all, over half of the companies, they don't discover their own compromise. Somebody else tells them. It's usually one of their vendors. They, they notice that something else is happening because once they infiltrated your system, then they start going after your vendors and customers and so forth, and it's a, it's an, it's a nonstop process. And so generally, somebody's vigilant, and they report it to that company saying, I, I believe you've been compromised. Over half don't recognize it themselves, but when they do... There's things that they can do to get out of it, and large part of that is what I was referring to by having a separate data backup system that will get you up and running and, and keep you profitable uh, if you're a company um, and keep your information safe. But some of the things that we want to tell you as best practices is make sure that you're updating your software and implement automated patching. It's not a foolproof method, but it does help. I, I wanted to touch on another issue. Uh, months ago, I was talking to Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and in one day, they had three uh, bomb threats called into different schools. N none of them turned out to be anything, but when I was talking to the brass there, they were saying, you would not believe how common this is. And this spring, you and the U.S. Attorney for Nevada are going to talk to students, warning them not to make these hoax threats online or to authorities. Is it a pretty common problem here in Nevada? It's common across the United States, and what you're referring to is Think Before You Post. It's an initiative that we're jointly involved in, and we understand that young people sometimes don't always think things through, and when you're posting things on the Internet to get a rise or to have notoriety or to get out of a test that you may have to take at school— you want to think before you put that out there because it's a federal crime, even if you are, you know, a teenager. It's a federal crime, and it's going to be taken seriously. And that simple act could alter your trajectory as far as what your job prospects are going to be in the future and what kind of colleges will, will take a look at you if you have such a mark against you. We want to make sure that people are utilizing the wonderful app applications that are out there appropriately. So don't put out threats to people or to institutions. Don't engage in cyberbullying where you're picking on somebody else in school because they're different. Those kind of things are going to get you into a lot of trouble, and we want to educate the entirety of the state of Nevada to the extent we possibly can so that they're not making those mistakes and they're not ruining their lives or hurting others. Before we go, if you listen to the news here in Las Vegas sometimes, or if you look at the local newspapers, it seems like crime is just rampant. M murders, burglaries, beatings. But the FBI just released a preliminary national statistics for the first half of 2018 that shows 
violent and property crimes falling across the country. Is that the same in Las Vegas? You know, Vegas has actually seen a reduction in violent crime and property crime, and the sheriff and I have been very pleased to see that happening. This doesn't happen at by accident. This happens because the partnerships that we have in the state of Nevada with all of our federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies is working. And we're not going to stop. We've we've had some success, and we're very proud and very pleased with that success, but we're not going to stop. We're not going to take our foot off the gas. We're going to continue to try through efforts like Project Safe Neighborhood, which is a Department of Justice initiative, to go and make those communities that may feel not as safe, much safer. And that's going to require a lot of effort, and we're up to that challenge. FBI Special Agent Aaron Rouse heads the FBI in Nevada and was in charge of the investigation into the 2017 mass shooting on the Strip. Agent Rouse, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.